Marina, the last um, stage entrance you made was in Paris at the opera, at the Palais Garnier. Um, how was that? Wait, wait a second. What? Is something happened? Ah, oh, I just came from Paris. I made the seven deaths of Maria Callas. And if somebody told me 10 or even 15 years ago that I would do opera as a performance artist, I think you're totally crazy. I mean, it's insane to do opera. Opera is such an old form of art. It's like dinosaurs of, of art. You sit there four hours, five hours. Basically, it's a little bit boring in, me, in my case. But then I wanted to do this work with Maria Callas. And I wanted to do this work for a long, long time. When I was only 14 years old, I was in the kitchen of my grandmother and uh, in the breakfast, and we always had this old Bakelit radio, listening sound, music, and news, whatever. In ex-Yugoslavia, always bad news. But anyway, in one point came this incredible voice. And I remember stand up in the middle of the kitchen and start crying. I was 14, and I cried, and cried, and cried. And I, it, the voice really made me so emotional. And then later on, the, the you know, speaker said, this was the voice of Maria Callas, and blah, blah, blah. And then I want to know everything about Maria Callas. I want who she was and why she had such an emotional reaction on me. And this was a long, long time ago. And now, the, finally, I made this opera. It's about seven deaths of Maria Callas. In every opera, women die for love. And you know, she died for love, too. And I almost died for love in my life. And my work saved me. But her work didn't save her. So I was thinking it was a moment to have homage to her. There, there are some very um, distinguished and, and important emerging actors in the audience tonight. And one of the things about your work is heightened consciousness and a heightened sense of self. And as a performance artist, you become a conduit, but you tend not to be acting out. Is there something fundamentally different for you going on stage somehow identifying with Maria Callas, or is it still an extension of performance art, or, or do you act sometimes? But first of all, in the early 70s, I hate theatre, acting, all of this. You know, the ketchup is not the blood, and knife is not real knife, and uh, all these people standing in the dark, and you have to rehearse, and you play somebody that's not you. But you know, after 50 years of performing, I become very comfortable that I am actually okay performance artist. So I could indulge myself in experimenting with different medias. And the theater was one of them. And I start with Bob Wilson, made a piece called Life and Dead of Marina Abramovic, which is also considered as opera, which I actually he directed. And uh, I worked with Willem Dafoe already there. And Willem Dafoe he was a wonderful actor, and he really teach me that actually it's not true, that you can totally go into the character of the person and become this character. And he actually helped me to find the key how I can do this the same. You said in your autobiography that you said there are three marinas, there may be more, but you said there's warrior, um, bullshit, and romantic, or lover. I think bullshit's your phrase. Um, do you find that you have to act out various versions of yourself? No, the three marina lives nicely together inside myself now. But in the beginning, of course, I was ashamed of the you know, different marinas. I was definitely ashamed of bullshit one. But I always want to present these heroic spiritual marinas, can do everything. But then this little one who really cry and, and leave chocolates and look the bad movies and like the gossip and fashion and all this, where do you put this one? But then when I really realized that actually it's so important to show to the audience your own vulnerability. And when you show to audience your own vulnerability and all these things that you hide generally from everybody, it's such incredible relief because all of them have the same like me. So we could connect in this vulnerability much more than in strengths. Do you feel more vulnerable, less vulnerable, or as vulnerable as you always have done as you get older and perform? You know, the, 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 the piece that everybody knows, artist is present in MoMA, where I sit you know, for, for three months, eight hours a day. I was 65 years old when I made this piece. I could never, ever 
consider making this piece when I was 20 or 23 or 25 or 30. I didn't have this wisdom, I didn't have this, the, this concentration, the, the mental, physical power, I will never have any of this. It takes time, it takes really time to kind of understand things. And, and that's why I think now I've, I feel more secure than I was young. When you're young, you do things, but you're not conscious about every single step you're doing it, and you don't kind of connect the points. Much later, you need time. You, you have this aura about you that draws people, and that may have been developed over time. I, I didn't know you when you were very young, but when I met you in the 90s. You certainly were charismatic. But people want this physical contact with you. That's what the artist is present showed. That's what the piece at the Serpentine, 512 hours showed. The commission that you've just done, the collaboration you've done with We Transfer until tonight, has been done digitally. And, the, and your teaching method, the Abramovich method, is done digitally, and the, the, the eye contact you have with people is done digitally. How, how is that being once, twice, three times removed? Is that just something you want to look at because of the idea of legacy and what happens when you're no longer here? Or is it technology that's actually making you think in a different way? But you know, in, again, talking about the 70s, without nostalgia at all, but in the 70s, I had, you know, performance, when you're doing it those days, it was 10 artists or 10, you know, friends who would come to watch. This was like a big group. When came 30 people, we say, oh my God, how we can deal with this such a large group. And now when we're talking, I don't know what's the, what's the now number in. Stats. It, it was the number, it's something 130, unbelievable. 130 million people have gone onto the website. 580,000 people have watched one video through. 540,000 have done an exercise with you. So watched the video and then done the exercise. And this is the most incredible statistic for me. A thousand people, just over a thousand people, have watched and done everything. So that's 13 videos and the time that that takes. So that's pretty impressive. It's incredibly it's a different scale. impressive to me too. So that means that, you know, it's also very important because I spent my entire life to put the performance into mainstream art. Because in the beginning there was nobody art. Everybody was ridiculous performance. They were, you should put in mental hospital. This is shit. This is bullshit and all that. And then you know, if I read the criticism of that time, I would not even leave home. I have to believe so strongly that's important form of art. You know, performance. There are also lots of bad performances, but performance is good can change your life. Performance is kind of life energy. It's a time-based art, and you have to be in the spot when it's happening. And when you have communication and energy dialogue with the public, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's something can really click in, in a very deep emotional level, and some change happen. And what is the incredible power of performance is immaterial. There is nothing there except memory of the audience left. And then that memory can live through the actually, uh, you know, uh, memory of it, telling the memory to other people. And that's how it is. And this is so difficult to maintain. and so difficult to kind of cherish this form of art. But I found also out that the long duration of performance art have the more power than any other. Because it's easy to make something half an hour, three hours, even three days. But if you make something one month, two months, three months, every single day, become life itself, and then change everything. You change, and the public with you is changing. Public create new community, the performance community. They come because they don't believe that you're doing next day, and they come to support you, and then the children bring the parents, and the parents bring the friends, and become this huge, immense support family. And this is so beautiful about performance, which other forms of art don't have. Yeah, but the music, thing, has, music, music. It does, but the figures I've just given you are kind of, I mean, they're true, but they're abstract. You, you can't, I mean, I can tell you them, but you, you can't experience them. When you were at MoMA, at the Museum of Modern Art 2010, 800,000 people came through the museum for the three months you were there. That was the official attendance of that. You must be aware, therefore, of, of the furore and the physical mass of people there. But I'm curious about your memories of that now, 10, 11 years on. Do you remember a lot 
Or do you remember just random encounters with individual people? Or do you remember a kind of stadium atmosphere? No, I, I remember lots of individual people. Because, the, you know, human beings have a different type of energy. You have bad energy, you have good energy, you have low energy, you have high energy, all kinds of stuff. And some people I remember because of the, that impact, energetic impact, so strong. I, and, I, and I remember certain things that I will never forget in my life. I remember, I never forget this moment when very early in the morning came this woman and she was, I think, Indonesian or Asian woman and she had a little child completely covered in the bundle in her lap and she was looking with me with the most sad eyes I ever saw in my life, just staring at me and very slowly after maybe one hour she opened the, 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 the hood of the child and I saw the big scar on, on her head and she looked at me and she left. And then, you know, we published the book with every single person, you know, looking at me at the moment. And a year later, she contacted me, she found my address. And she said to me, you know, that morning I went to the doctor, my child had a brain tumor, and the doctor told me that he will not have any more any radiation, uh, you know, the treatments, because there's no hope, let him die in peace. And I came to you. And this was the moment she held the child. And then, you know, uh, you know I, we wrote the letter to each other. And then a year later, I met her again, and she was pregnant with a new child. There was a new life coming. And this was really content came of that kind of moment. And also, 30, no, 36 guards of MoMA, who are the, you know, normally people guarding the, the, the museum in uniforms, they will go home in the weekends, take the uniforms, come back to the museum, wait in the line for hours to sit with me. This never happened. It's kind of crazy. Insane. Something happened there that was, that was, you know, on the human, human level, different. Well, I know you've only just realised this piece, but that kind of connection can't happen, or can it? Do you engage digitally? Are you able to do so with, with people? Internet? I really, that's why we, the digital thing is to me so interesting, the how many people participating. You know, like, like this also experience we're having here. You know, they asked me, the, we, the, we transfer platform come to me, they asked me three things. They asked me first to give them a list of five artists that I really believe they're great artists. I choose five very young artists, well, all long duration performance artists, and I give them the list. And they made a wonderful presentation of the work, and they got a lot Lots of lots of viewers for the public who is not always, you know, known about performance art. Then the second thing they asked me, you know, to uh, give them five objects that I will bring to the next century. And then I say, okay, this is my five objects. It was clear to me, Rose of Jericho, that is the plant that is dry in a dead valley, and when you pick it up and put in the water, after 45 minutes become green, and the water is gone, become dry again. This is the kind of plant that can reach immortality for thousands of years. Of course, for the next century, we should bring it. Then the next one was Starry Nights of Van Gogh. It's full of electricity and, and molecules in the air Van Gogh can perceive in his paintings. And I love Van Gogh, incredible energetic artist. Then there was another one, the, you know, the book Pain of Others, which is the Susan Zontag book, a small little book. But she really talked about cruelties, about the human, the atrocities about you know how we killing other human beings you know all us on the planet and then she asked this important question who are they and who are we why we make a distinction there's always them and not us so this is something that i would take to the next century to think about you know that once we look into the past we should really change and create new future and then again, somebody for my birthday, they gave me a tiny little stone, but this was like a, like, a, like, a, like a grain of rice. And there was a certificate of NASA and was written, stone from Mars. And I'm crazy about Mars. You know, I say uh, to, to Bronson, if you can give me only one way ticket, I don't come back, but he refused. <laughs> just anyway in space. But anyway, this was a little stone. So we, you know, we transfer work with me and translate this into the red sand environment with the little balls that kind of be like our own little molecules in the space. And then I also put sound installation, but you hear the voice. It's my voice. Actually, I record for 36 hours, 10,000 names of 10,000 stars in our galaxy took 36 hours to record it, so you can hear this. It's a lots of stars in galaxy, and I didn't even scratch the surface. And then the, the last, of course, part for me was crystal, 
which, you know, for me is very important because I think a simplified computer of the planet and of energy and cons can contain light, electricity. And now we have little chips, tiny little chips that entire the, the, the history of the planet can be placed in the little crystal chips and sent somewhere in the space. So this is my five objects. And then after these five exercises, which I propose, very slowly drink a glass of water. It takes 30 minutes, you can't do it too fast now. Then, then what is next one? Next one is slow motion walk, rice counting, um, eye gazing. And this is the exercises, you know, they really bring you into own self and to give you a certain sense of tranquility. And I think because of COVID and because of being so much in home, the people really looked at the side and they really actually work and exercise, which I'm incredibly happy because this is, I call Abramovich method. And Abramovich method was made out of my traveling through the all kinds of countries in the world, living with Aborigines, working with Tibetan monks, going to shamans in Brazil, and I pick up what is the best that actually I can communicate to everybody. It doesn't matter professional, you are cleaning the street or president of the country. So I don't, I don't have that commitment. I tried it. Uh, I've got attention deficit disorder, clearly, but I couldn't keep eye contact with you. And it's partly because um, I know that at some stage, I have to do this in the flesh with you, that you do these workshops, you, you're going to do them in Athens, we've been talking about it, I was going to come to the Star House, and that's a kind of privilege, but I, in some ways, um, I don't want to do it with you digitally until I can't possibly have the chance of doing it or seeing you, seeing you in the flesh. But that's, your point would be, I should do it online, it doesn't matter. The digital, the exercise is the exercise, the state of mind is the state of mind. I don't need the aura of your physical being here with me. Yeah, but you know, I'm going to die one day, what you do? <laughs> you, you, have to, you have to find the solution, and digital is one solution, definitely, and also the mixed reality is another one. You know, I don't like argumented reality so much because you put the glasses and you forget the body. Body don't exist, it's only the brain. I always get headache from this. But if you take the, the mixed reality, you have the glasses, you see reality as you are, and you see this mixed reality in the same time. And mixed reality was built from 30, 40, 50 movie cameras. So really kept electricity and lights of your own molecules of your own body. And somehow this is closest to the, to the real than video or the, or the photography. So we have to look, you know. Of course, and, and I think the whole issue about legacy and performance art is a really interesting one because obviously some performances were photographed there are relics, I mean, the physical objects that were used yeah. in performance. But then increasingly in, in uh, 2005, you started the idea of re-performing other people's works so that in a sense, your own works can be re-performed. Now we're looking at using digital technology, but also the technology, you know, we have enough, you were telling me, to recreate, when you are no longer with us, there's enough scanned digital imagery to produce your avatar as you've yes, done before. Yeah. Without so, projection on any surface, you go through me. It's no surface involved anymore. You know, it's really big, big difference. So in the re-performance, which still fascinates me, um, you have put yourself in extreme positions. You've put your own life at risk to a certain extent. I mean, restless energy with an arrow, you and uh, Ulai, you know, if he lets go or slips, that, you're, you're gone, it's straight through your heart. Where's the limit for what you would expect re-performance to, to happen? Or it, can anything be re-performed? For me, you know, my generation hates me that I give permission to artists to re-perform my work. But I'm really thinking that your work is not yours anymore. It's given up to the universe, to the other people. And, uh, and they have the chance also to experience. But I will never give permission to anything which is actually, you know, the, the, the threatening your own life. I will never, like Rhythm Zero, which I have pistol and bullet, I will never give permission to somebody to do this piece, because to me, I only can risk my own life, but nobody else. Yeah, we, kind of, for know. those who don't know, Rhythm Zero was done in Naples in 1974, I think, where you, you were in a gallery, you sat there, there was a table full of objects. I didn't sit, I stand. Sorry, you stood. <laughs> Big and a table full of objects, wasn't there? <laughs> and the audience, the visitors, could do anything they wanted in theory. Because I decided, and I told them they can, and I take all my responsibility decision, including killing me if they want.
but I was 23 too, you know, pretty crazy <laughs> those days. <laughs> But I actually want to re repeat this performance in Guggenheim when I then seven easy pieces. They didn't give to me. All the lawyers went crazy. You see, you in America, they're really going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't give me. Um, there's also another aspect to both legacy and memorial that you're exploring, technology, which, which involves alabaster. And this is a show that you've got at the Listen that I haven't seen, but I've seen work in this series. Opening 14, please go to see two spaces, Cork Street, Bell Street. One is video installation and one is the alabaster work, yeah. And these are images from the seven deaths, yep. but they're cut into the stone. But it, it almost feels as if your image is embedded in the stone. Um, do you think your interest in death has grown more as you become older, more mature, or, or have you always been from childhood obsessed with mortality and, and the presence of death? When I was 17, I remember my birthday, I was the first time that I realized, oh my God, I'm going to die one, one day. And I was so sad and crying. And I really think about that every day. Because when you think about that every day, you enjoy life much more. Because you cut the bullshit. You just concentrate on really things what matters. That's so important. But honestly, I made now the, the you know, the Life and Death of Marina Brown, which is Seven Death of Maria Callas, my show in, in Royal Academy, you know, in 2023 is, is going to be all of afterlife. I'm done with dying. I'm only going to live now. I promise. <laughs> no, that. There's a, there's a moment in your life. But can I talk about alabaster? Wait, when we you can. talk. You, you know, for. I am so much into immaterial things, the things that you just can't touch, can, can, you, know, you just can experience deep inside an emotional level. But I was looking for seven years into the material, that physical material that can keep life and death in the same time, mortality and immortality in the same space. And then I found this, the actually called is alabaster, which is stone, which transparency and can crack very easily. And the, we find the technique to cut this alabaster in a certain way. When you see the image, you see the total image. When you come close to the image, image is just dis destroyed in front of you into pieces of rocks, into nothing. So this is the, actually the first time that I'm satisfied to create the object that because kept these two things life and death in the same time so i didn't compromise to myself please go to see the show is in cork street and in listen i have the big installation in bell street of all seven deaths that you can see but this is like you know it colors music and and me dying in different ways you painted when you were very young then then performance and um i've never seen it quite as explicitly but you said that when you walked the great wall of china this moment in your life and career, 1988, when you literally broke up with Ule as lovers and also as, as creative partners. But you said it was the feel of the different materials on your feet as you walked the two and a half thousand miles of the Great Wall of China that made you much more materially aware. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, no, that was different. I, I walk, uh, when I walk the Great Wall of China, which is only 2,500 kilometers, which is kind of three months. But anyway, so I, I walk on different f the, the, the grounds. Sometimes it's green stone, sometimes black stone, sometimes it's just clay ground, sometimes full of crystal chips. And, and then I will always go to the village at the end of the day and ask who is the oldest person in the village. And I found the people 105, 6, 7, 200, you know, 20 years old. And I will always ask the translator to tell me the story of the area. And they always was talking about dragons fighting, the black rock fighting the green dragon. And I find out that all these rocks and ground I'm talking and I'm walking with, they're made from different materials. And this really influenced my state of mind. So as the wall was away from the normal or public, I decided to create, they call them transitory objects, objects made out of this material or copper, or the amethyst, or the crystals, tourmaline, and create that kind of feeling that the public can interact and understand that energies, you know, were why we're not being with me on the wall. That, that um, moment where you broke with Ulai, and then we know that there was a court case, which was kind of acrimonious, and then there was a kind of makeup during the artist's present, but then the court case, and then I was with you in, uh, Sweden when he appeared and you were very generous and now he's died. Um, is there reconciliation between you and him or 
is there animosity even beyond the grave? You know, my relation with Ulai, oh my God, it's a very intimate question. So it was, you know, we met, we was born, we met on our birthday and we were same day born and we fall in madly in love. It was very passionate, very erotic relationship. And we started for 12 years. And then after 12 years, we say goodbye on the Great Wall of China because, you know, stop working. Relations have ends too. And then, you know, we was okay with, with, uh, with our, with our um, you know, relationship, but then become lots of problems. And then on the end, you know, he came to see me in the, in the I, I invited him as a, my guest of honor for the MoMA show. And there's this famous video who everybody saw when we hold the hands because I didn't know that he will sit in the front of me. And this was my entire life was in the front. And it was so incredibly intense. And we cry both and we left each other. And then two months later, he sue me. And sue me on every single side point. And I, it, it, Dutch law, it's very complicated to explain to you, but it was stupid Dutch law, whatever. I lost everything. So the newspaper asked me what they're going to say about this. And I say, okay, he win, I lost, next. What we can do? And then I went into the, I was so actually angry and so devastated. And I took this trip to India, which takes from New York 36 hours to get to the farthest place with only 18 rooms. It's a Ayurveda clinic, which they do, you know, you have to wake up five in the morning, do, do all this kind of yogas and the, and the Tibetan exercises and so on. And I arrived there really to go away from this. Five in the morning, who I see? Ulai with his wife, right in the same place. <laughs> This was like, a, I remember calling my office, called Juliana, where's Juliana? I, yeah, I called Juliana and I said, do you believe we see? I'm going to leave now. But I pay already and he pay also already. So I decide this is destiny. So we stay one month, every morning, five o'clock meditation, five o'clock everything. And then we forgive each other. And this was so important. You know, it's very easy to say, you know, to forgive. Very difficult to do. But when you really forgive from the heart, it's incredible release of negativity, of all this bad energy. And it was really important. We forgive each other three years before he died. And, uh, you know, and then we become friends and we really talk, you know, and he was sick for 10 years and, you know, it was not surprise. But then, you know, we made great work and I remember only the good things right now. That's but good. And very moving, and and you're making at the moment a, not about Ulai, but a wall of forgiveness in Ukraine. So that's personal and humanitarian and universal. Do you want to just talk about that because it's an amazing project? Uh, what we in Kiev? Oh, wow, well, in Kiev, it's in Kiev. The, there is a project called Babiar in Ukraine, which in the Second World War they actually the the you know the German Nazi kill more than hundred thousand. Jewish people, the people from mental hospital, and the gypsy people. It was one of the biggest massacres in, 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 at the time in Ukraine. In the, and then later on, the Russians came and built on the old Jewish cemetery, they built the, 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 the buildings, so kind of totally tried to cover this whole thing. And now there is a big discovery of that, of that site, and this is a big park. And I'm one of the artists who are doing the project that's going to open 6th of October. And I was thinking how to approach this. You know, it's, it's, it's so much, you know, happening in the Second War. It's so much happening with our humans killing other humans. That I was thinking how I can extend the idea of praying war in Jerusalem, that is, you know, famous wall that people go and pray. How I can make the wall, but this wall will be wall of crying and wall of forgiveness. Because we have to think about forgiveness, finally. So I made this wall, we are constructing, as we speak, now I show you, construction building. It's a 40 meter long, it's made out of coal. Coal is very kind of really material, come from the earth. And then is there we place 120 pure big crystals from Brazil, which are actually placed in the position of, of human head, heart and stomach for 50 people to face the wall and, you know, get this energy and really meditate on forgiveness. So that's the piece I'm doing. It's not ready yet, it's opening six, yeah. And you believe art has a capacity to heal? You know, 
Not only. I, I never wanted to art have capacity only one thing. When you tell me political art, I'm not happy with political art because political art can be like, you know, old new, good news today, old news tomorrow. If you just say healing art, then you go into this, you know, new age meditation. Again, it's not the right thing. Art have to have many layers of meaning. Art to have to have, have to be disturbing, have to ask questions, have to be spiritual, have to have healing, have to be political, have to be social and have to predict future. That's important. And every society take the layer what he need at the time. That's why the art who have many layers have many, many lives. You're, you often talk about your life as a journey. Um, and in relationship to the, um, the Rose of Jericho, Flower of Jericho, you talked about encountering that when you were making a journey across America with Ulai. And in those 12 years, you traveled a huge amount. I mean, you lived in a van, you were nomadic. You now live in America, having lived in Amsterdam, but you were telling me you haven't been there since June and you won't get back there till October. And that, in some ways, is the life of a successful artist who has commissions and work around the place. But do you still feel nomadic? Or are there, is there a place on Earth that feels more like home than anywhere else? You know, I, I realized long, long time ago, the only home I have is my body, it's my cell. There's no other home. Every hotel room, every aeroport, bus station, that I don't care where I am anymore, really. There's no planet, there's no country, there's no specific place. Everything is in transit. The only place you really have that you can count of you is your own body. So what about architecture and space? Because you have an amazing capacity to activate and animate and play with space and you live in an interesting space and you have a house that's shaped like a star but these feel places that you're passing through not places that you're rooted in i like the idea that there's a place somewhere but i'm not attached to anything the, 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 I don't know, there's something happened a long time, probably since I left Yugoslavia. I'm not attached to physical things. I, I don't care, they're so impermanent, you know, and they come and they go and, and everything pass. Which I suppose it, it, in some ways is reflected in your choice of objects, because they're not really possessions, they're things either to share or things that release energy that is a kind of communal thing. Yeah, but the other people was asking five things they would probably like to maybe favorite dress or shoes or, or whatever, I don't know, you know, piece of furniture. I, all of these pieces you, I, I have, they're not mine. They belong to everybody and you can have them. When you were young, you said that very few people knew about performance art. Uh, there were small numbers. So in a sense, you can take risk and it doesn't really matter. As you get more successful, do you care what people think about you whose opinions you don't respect? Because broadly speaking, there is a huge admiration, curiosity, and I would say love for you. But there are people who take against you and write horrible things. How do you feel? Can you deal with that? I made this, uh, the, my, when I was 70, I made this book, my memoir called Walking Through the Walls which is also translated in, in, here in, in, uh, in England. And uh, the book is dedicated to friends and enemies because there's so many friends who became enemies, so many enemies who become friends, all of the categories. But you know, it's very interesting. The more you have success, the more enemies you have. It's like they, they come and they are there and they, you know, they criticize me for things that I'm not guilty at all. I've been criticized that I am jet setter, that I am, you know, the famous, that I am, you know, the, but they put me in that position. I'm always the same. But they, you know, the first, they, they glorified you and then they criticize you because you're in that position where they put you in. It's crazy. I mean, can we talk about what happened this morning? Well, yeah. You've, it's oh my God, let me talk about this morning. Wait. <laughs> okay. So, I wake up in a good mood. I, I I love to have a tea first in the morning, which is always Yorkshire gold with all, all almond milk. I love Yorkshire gold. Then, then I do yoga, and then I look at, you know, what the hell I have to do, the news is the things that, okay. This is the Times, you newspaper. I think that England in, uh, absolutely is the one who invent tabloids, and you're so good in it. But this really hurt me. I open this, so I have three shows here. We transfer, I will show also in uh, the, the Listen Gallery, and I show in Koronaki Gallery, which is called Humble Work, group show with the two other 
wonderful young artist. And you know, it's really to talk about my work. So I have a meeting and talk with uh, Rachel, right, Rachel. Rachel Campbell-Johnson, Campbell -Johnson. A, a serious writer. She's actually... a really good writer and wrote beautiful article. And I'm really happy with the article. But little things. Without any, you know, our, our kind of, uh, how you call it, the, the, the permission, came the title and the two images, so I don't know where they get them. So, the title, are you ready? My key to happiness is young lover, dirty jokes, and magic crystals. <laughs> this is really fucking hell to me. And then, of course, the, my partner, who is beautiful young man, I mean, not that young, he's 53. So, <laughs> his photograph and me, like this is the main thing in my life. But this is my private life, it's not my work. And then the really important work with this Moy Nairo Rest Energy, cut in half. When you publish the, 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 the painting, you don't cut half in painting. You publish the painting, it's totally disrespectful. I hate this. Then I heard, this is not right. And then also the, my alabaster work, tiny little mignon here. So I ask, I ask, you know, who made these titles? But in Britain, the titles are not made by the writer. You have different department making titles. This is a really horrible thing to do to somebody <laughs> come to your country like that. Uh I think what you need to do is log on to WeTransfer and there's a brilliant set of videos that will just calm you down. You can learn <laughs> how to count rice, you can drink slowly, you can... Drink. <laughs> it's brilliant because I rarely... You don't get angry publicly, but that was pretty good. What else... <laughs> well, I was really angry. Huh? Yeah, and what, what else makes you angry? Sorry, what? What else makes you angry? Silly headlines in newspapers don't relate to the thing, is one thing, but what injustice, makes you angry? Injustice, injustice and telling lies, this makes me angry. Lies and injustice, that's really, and you know, I can't stand it. It, it physically hurts me, that's it. And do you express anger regularly, or are you as controlled as you normally seem in the methods? You, in other words, do you practice what you preach? Are you, are you a contemplative you know, the, meditative No, individual? the very, very, very few things really I explode. I don't. I don't explode. And I don't angry. But th this, was, this was so kind of, you know, the, the untasteful and so vulgar. And, and putting these two of us images like that is... Un I agree. And, 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 and then, you know, and where is my work? Why, why if, I don't know, if you do this to your other artists, why we don't talk about my work? I have 50 years of my work. I'm not, but private life is, is you know, this is for tabloids, but not for times. I agree. Although you do tell filthy jokes, so filthy that you dirty can't Dirty jokes is true. I always tell dirty jokes. But, but, but that's, again, my private thing. <laughs> and co politically not correct. Not, no, not, not at all. Um, can, but you, we mentioned the Susan Sontag book and uh, concerning the pain of others. And you have put your own body through pain. You've pushed it to the limits of physical and mental uh, endurance, I suppose, in a way. Um, uh, you talk about it must be a collective sense of pain. And I know the, mes I know, I know the messages of Susan's book. But you, you have pushed yourself in ways that most other people, or many other people, haven't. Um, what's the motivation for that? It's very simple. Human beings are afraid of three things. Pain, mortal mortality, and, uh, and suffering. So these three things I stage in the form of performance, and I go through this in the front of audience, using your own energy and give it back to you. So I'm your mirror. If I can do this to myself, and liberate myself from the fear of pain, and fear of mortality and fear from suffering, that's the inspirational message to you. But, are you, but are you also play, playing with the obsession that people have that Susan Sontag talks about, the kind of almost pornography of violence, that people are sort of drawn to bestial horror and uh, for whatever reason, 
But are you playing with, with, with that kind of veneer of civilization that actually we're quite close to animalism? No, 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 no. I, my inspiration is so much to do with ancient cultures, ceremonies, rituals, when they really go through the, that kind of very deep, deep emotional, you know, the, 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 the sacrifices and blood and cutting ceremonies, where you're really actually dealing with the pain, liberate yourself from fear and get into different state of consciousness. This is so much more interesting because fear doesn't bring you anywhere. When I, you know, this is why my book is called Walking Through the Wall. If I see the wall, it's not that I'm standing in the front, I'm walking through. Next wall, walking through. When you say no to me, it's only the beginning. So that's the kind of thing, you know, create that kind of warrior and element in yourself that you can deal with everything. That's the motivation, not kind of to enjoy the horror. And I don't like any pain in my own life. I mean, I'm not interested at all. I actually, <laughs> I cut the onion, I cry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to over psychoanalyze you, but you, you have in your autobiography talked a lot about the kind of violent relationship you have with your mother or your mother's own violence too. I mean, both your parents were partisan heroes in uh, Yugoslavia, and Tito's Yugoslavia. But it was quite, there were violent moments in childhood. Do you think that's possibly where your uh, exploration of pain and a sort of obsession with it to some extent come from? Because even your early paintings were about car crashes or lorry crashes or collisions? I don't know. It started a long time, you know. There is one, Jeanette Fischer, who made a really interesting little book, translated in English and German, called uh, Talking to, Psychoanalyst Talking to the Artist. And she actually explored, not my mother as much as the older men in my life. I remember told my partner now, he said, I'm so happy I'm not in this book. Because she really explained the logic of things. And I think the one of the most important, actually, early experience in my childhood is my father, learning me the lesson to swim. And I really kind of formed my life in many ways. Do you know that story? No. You're really? Because you almost know all my stories. <laughs> no, no, okay. So I was six years old. I didn't want to swim. So he bring me to the you know, low, low water and learn me to swim. And I learned to swim. But then without any explanation, he took me to the little rowing boat, put me in the middle of the sea, with him, take me out and just throw him in the sea and start rowing away. And he rowed away like a hundred meters, like from here to maybe down there. And without looking back, and I, six years old, totally forgot that I know to swim. I got into this terrible panic. I start drowning and I go down and up, down, up, drinking the water and screaming his name and he's not looking. Absolutely, back to, to me. And I start screaming again and drawing and get more water and I really was almost drowning. And I realized, He's not going to look. He doesn't give a shit about me. He doesn't love me. It's my father. How he could let me die? And then, you know, in that moment, I got this anger. It's huge anger, but anger of, of, of to, to exist, to be alive. And I really start swimming. And I start swimming with the full effort to the boat. He's still not looking, but he hear me coming. And when he hear me coming, 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 he just put his hand like this, pick me up like a little dog, put me in the car, and that was it. But that was the lesson that I learned, that whatever happened, only person to realize yourself. There's nobody else in the world. And that feeling of total loneliness that I had was, you know, I never kind of fulfilled that. That's, that's there. You still have that sense? I still have. This is the loneliness that you learn that is, is all up to you. There's nobody else there. You know, everything else is relative. And that formed my, my also the, the idea of the warrior, literally warrior. You know, you're the only one who can do things. Performance art is a serious pursuit for you, and performance art actually raises some very serious issues. But a lot of pioneering performance art was incredibly serious and took itself incredibly seriously. And one of the, one of the many things about you that brings joy to others, and you clearly get joy, is humour as well. That you actually believe in the seriousness of what you do, but you don't always take it so seriously. And, um, for that, among, amongst many things, Marina, we thank you. I don't buy the idea that you're going off into space to die. I think you're going to outlive many of us. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next 25 years. Uh, I, 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 and, um, Can I just uh, say uh, something with humour? Yes. The hu you I thought know? you might want to end with a joke, but that's No, no, you. just the humour. You know, the, the His Holiness Dalai Lama he, he really learned me this. He said, it's so important open with a good joke, whatever. The most serious, the most difficult criticism you have to give to somebody, first tell him something good and then kill him with the truth. <laughs> <laughs> On which note, Marina Abramovich, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.